Perry of the Condor. We have uh, Kelly Soros in here to talk about it today. And Kelly's career has been entirely in the field of wildlife conservation. Um, he first worked to recover the peregrine falcon. Did I say that right? Yep. Okay. And then followed by the bald eagle. And since 1966, the California condor. He has a BS degree in wildlife and fisheries management from West Virginia University. And he's got a master's in public administration from Golden State Kelly has been the executive director uh, of the Ventana Wildlife Society since 2003. So with that, here's Kelly. Thank you, Chuck. All right. <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me today. Um, and if by chance, I could do this, right? Just, just checking? OK, good. If I get antsy and want to move around, I'm going to do that. Uh, anyway, thanks again for having me. Um, as Chuck mentioned, I've been uh, focused on wildlife conservation my whole entire career. When I was growing up in uh, West Virginia University, I started out in the engineering program and, and I took uh, one look at Fortran and I said, nope, I'm going to be a wildlife biologist instead. And it's been a difficult path, I'll tell you that. There's not a, not a whole lot of opportunity. Better? <laughs> wow, okay. So, you know, not a whole lot of opportunity as a wildlife biologist, but my other choice was a musician, so here I am. What instrument? Bass, bass guitar. Thanks for asking. <clears throat> anyway, um, so first off, before I start going through these slides, you know, a lot of people ask me, why the condor? You know, why care? What, what, what's, what's the big deal, you know? So I kind of want to start with that. Now, first off, of course, you've got the ecological niche. That's, that's a valid point, no question. Uh, to me, it goes much deeper than that. I think it's, it's more about the responsibility of protecting our environment and understanding that we're part of that environment along with our, our wildlife. And maybe not every species needs to survive, but we ought to make an effort to coexist, and in a way, the condor serves as an icon or a, 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 a mission behind that purpose, I guess. Um, and then I started working with these birds after 25 years, partway through that time, I, I sort of fell in love with them, and I realized why. And hopefully at the end of this presentation, you'll feel just a little bit more like I do. Now, let me make sure I, okay, just real quickly, if you've noticed uh, our, our logos, we still have the existing uh, Fontana Wildlife Society logo, but we also created a Condor Program logo, since our Condor Program started on the Big Sur Coast and is really unique uh, relative to uh, a lot of our partners, so we wanted to create that graphic. Oop, wrong way. Um, again, I was raised in West Virginia University. My first opportunity was working with peregrine falcons, and here I am holding a, a juvenile peregrine on the edge of a cliff, uh, getting ready to release it, and it was just an amazing experience. Peregrines were really easy. You let them go at a young age. Within weeks, they're killing food on their own, and they're off and, and doing great. So it was a, it was a wonderful uh, opportunity to, to get a start in, in, in uh, the recovery of, of wildlife. By that time, the peregrine was already on the comeback because DDT, which was the pesticide used for many, many years, uh, unfortunately caused, caused eggshell thinning in peregrines and a lot of other birds. So much so that for a period of time, many birds couldn't simply reproduce. So their numbers drastically declined and the peregrine falcon almost went extinct as a result of it. But once DDT was no longer being used, uh, in agricultural areas across the United States, the population rebounded. And so what my job was, was to take these young birds and release them in, into a new environment and, and get them reestablished. <clears throat> and that led to bald eagles. Uh, while I was still an undergrad at U West Virginia University, I did a volunteer effort to track down all the bald eagles in that state. At that time, there was very little known. Uh, where we had nesting pairs or how they were doing or anything. And so we, we put that together 
And uh, that caught the attention of this group, Ventana Wildlife Society, who was at that time reintroducing bald eagles on the Big Sur coast. <clears throat> uh, fast forward some 25 years later, our goal was only four breeding pairs from Santa Barbara to San Francisco. And at last count, we had 30 breeding pairs. Uh, and, and you can see just by these dots on the map, they're just scattered all over Central California. Uh, the Big Sur uh, release site was an excellent place to get them started. It was an entry point. Uh, ironically, none of them breed on the Big Sur coast. Uh, they like inland reservoirs. All those reservoirs that were built in the 50s and 60s that produce water for our ag, also wonderful habitats for bald eagles. So the species has rebounded dramatically. So, you know, here I am, I'm a young man, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm batting a thousand here, I've got a peregrine falcon under my belt, I've got bald eagles under my belt. And then we had an offer to reintroduce California condors. And I was like, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> That's gonna be a little bit more challenging. And uh, again, 25 years later, here I am. And we're not done by any stretch of the imagination. We still have a long way to go. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that. The condor program has many, many partners. It's led by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. That's who permits our work. But really on the ground, boots, uh, on the you know on the boots kind of work that we do is what's leading this effort. Uh, they're found condors are now found in four different locations. We uh, uh, the very first release was in Southern California. We got started right after that in, in Big Sur in Central California, and then the Arizona population was started by another nonprofit called the Peregrine Fund, different than ours. Uh, and then Baja, Mexico got started when San Diego Zoo and the Mexican government began releasing condors in Baja. And then what you might have seen in the news recently, a, a, a brand new release site in Northern California in collaboration with the Yurok tribe and the National Park Service. I haven't updated my map, but that's the newest location. So condors are now starting to be seen across the landscape. But the underlying problems that brought them to near extinction are still in, in need of being dealt with. Um, but let me, let me get into a little bit more about these birds, okay? They, they're very long-lived species. Hold on, I, I got ahead of myself. Um, that's just a little bit more of the history I think I already talked about. Yeah, that's the slide. So condors are, they're, they're highly social. They, uh, they do almost everything together except breeding and, and even in breeding sometimes we found that pairs will will actually form into trios where trios will, will participate in, in breeding we think that's really kind of an act of cooperative uh, behavior um, but the, but they're extremely social they, they roost overnight together in large groups they they feed together uh, they're, they're as social as wolves and primates it's, it's really fascinating because you wouldn't think of that when you when you first take a look at these birds they're long-lived, probably can live over 60 in, in the wild, maybe longer. We know in captivity, we have a uh, condor that's approaching 62, I think. Um, so we know they live a long time. That works well for, for uh, species like them. If they live a long time, um, then it demands a low fatality rate. So it's kind of like humans, actually. They reproduce more quick, quickly than we do. Uh, and, and humans, you know, we uh, have, what, almost 8 billion people on this, on this planet. So, so clearly it's not a reproductive uh, issue that, that, that brought these birds into extinction. And it was just over, uh, over it was just too much mortality. And the population just could not keep up. They were dying at excessive rates, 25% per year in the 1980s when they were being brought into captivity. So that's why they were all brought into captivity. These are long-lived birds. They, they reproduce slowly, but, but if you don't have fatality in the way, they do great, kind of like people. <clears throat> so just to show you a little bit about the variety of habitats these birds can, can thrive in, they're foraging on the coastline, feeding on marine mammals and things like that. By the way, they are obligate scavengers, so they don't kill anything. They're only looking for dead things. And then they can go inland and, and just a matter of hours and be in beautiful cattle country where you know, there's tons and tons of foraging opportunities, whether it's non-game animals like ground squirrels or coyotes or game animals 
uh, or occasional livestock that would unfortunately pass. <clears throat> so what we did is we, we, uh, we threw our name in the hat. We said, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll do our best to reintroduce condors. I said, how do you do it? <laughs> and uh, Fish and Wildlife Service gave us this big giant manual and we followed the manual to a T and unfortunately that first release was just terrible. These birds were not socialized the way they needed to be. They did not recognize themselves as themselves. They, weren't, they were essentially imprinted on people. They were not imprinted on themselves. And one of them was even uh, released and seen down in the office building at Post Ranch. <laughs> These birds were approaching people. They're nine and a half foot wingspan. They weigh 20 some pounds. You don't want that, trust me. So, you know, from a basic biology, behavioral biology standpoint, we knew we had to go back to the drawing board. So we met with the zoos and we came up with some different strategies. And mostly we came up with the mentoring strategy. So a lot of these birds are raised without their parents because we're trying to maximize production. We take the first egg, the parents then lay another egg, or, well, the female <laughs> lays another egg, and then thereby you get two eggs out of every pair in captivity. But then therein is the problem. You have to raise one of them because the other one's being raised by the parents. And so how do you do that? Uh, well, you've probably seen in the news, they have those condor puppets, everybody's nodding their head now. You know, they're great at marketing those things, but they do not work that great on, in real life. So we came up with this better strategy. Instead of using these little puppets and try to trick condors to think that they're, you know, this inanimate object, let's let them view actual condors while they're being raised through one-way glass. They had to do that because we couldn't let, uh, we couldn't let a neighboring parent see that chick. It would just disturb their breeding. And of course, this is all in captivity that I'm talking about. And all this work had to be done to, to bring this population back because it got down to just 22 individuals in 1982, almost completely extinct. So we, we threw that handbook out of the, you know, just threw it out and we, we dreamed up a whole new strategy. And this large structure was, was what took its place. The first strategy was to kind of put them out there and then hide and not really have anything you know, to be able to re-trap them with or anything later on. And so we felt like our hands were tied and these birds were behaviorally not uh, doing what they should be doing and, and it was kind of a mess. So we, we built this large facility so we could put a mentor inside the pen and teach those young whippersnappers how to act like real condors. And that's essentially what, it was, what was going on. Well, that next release was a total success. Five out of five birds were, were thriving in the wild for many, many years. And that, that formed a cohesive group upon which we could then add more condors to the flock and then we were able to get going. So it was a little rocky start, but it uh, then started to really take off. Uh, we then built another pen at Pinnacles National Park and, and teamed up with them. They've been uh, uh, releasing and managing condors with us since 2003. Occasionally we have to retrap the birds to test them, to health examinations, or uh, replace a radio transmitter, and then they get re-released. And one of the essential components of this project is to be able to radio track their movements. We need to know where they go. If one dies, we need to know why. Otherwise, we're sort of driving in the dark without our headlights on. And as, as it turns out, unfortunately, a whole lot of them have died. And so these radio transmitters have allowed us to track them down, collect them, get them into a, a lab where a necropsy can be done. It's sort of like an autopsy, but we call it a necropsy. And then some of these transmitters are even GPS enabled. So they're able to tell us where these birds are once or twice per minute, and it's all the way down to the accuracy of the size of that table. A lot of our work is, is just figuring out what these birds are doing, uh, where they're feeding, where they're nesting, you know, who's paired with who, and then it makes for fun storytelling because uh, I listen to my field crews, they come back and they start talking about these birds and who's mating with who and all this stuff. And I'm like, are you, are you talking about a soap opera? What are you, what are you talking about? I'm like, no, it's the birds. And so that's what, you know, this, this idea came. I'm like, well, let's tell these, let's tell these birds stories. They're really fascinating stories. 
So we created a, a, a bio for every single individual. We have an app online where you can plug in the number and the color and it'll poof, it'll pop right up and tell you who that bird is and how old it is and who it's mating with and all kinds of fun little tidbit stories. And it's, it's really fun. And a lot of our uh, supporters really find that to be uh, very, very uh, engaging. So then on top of that, we started telling stories and video and social media and, and so on. And one of those key stories I'll get to here in a bit. Now, when Connors first started finding food on their own in the Big Sur Coast, it was almost always California sea lions. This is a site here where a whole flock of them found a carcass, and within a matter of hours, a, a full-grown sea lion carcass was just completely uh, eaten and, and removed from the beach. It's one of the key things they do, right? They clean up the, clean up the landscape. Now in 2006, we documented the first whale feeding, and we went back in the literature and tried to figure out when that was recorded uh, previously, and it might be 400 years of, of a gap between the time condors fed on, on whales, because when the last remnant wild population was, was, uh, was you know, barely surviving in the 1980s, they were only surviving in Southern California, so for a long, long period of time, they had no access to the coast. Uh, once we started reintroducing condors to the coast, it bridged that gap, and they started feeding on, in marine ecosystems again. And so here they are feeding on a, on a dead whale carcass. Now, of course, we don't want to see dead whales, but when a dead whale does wash up, it'll feed the whole scavenger community for months. <coughs> of course, condors are not too picky. It just needs to be dead. So they're feeding on deer, uh, ground squirrels, coyotes. I mentioned you know, marine mammals. That could range anywhere from a gray whale all the way down to a sea otter in size, uh, porpoise, dolphin, you, know, you name it. They do not tend to feed on birds. I guess that's sort of code of ethics. I don't know. But, uh, they, uh, but they will eat fish if they find you know, salmon. Salmon runs have been known to be uh, quite good for them in the past. But mostly they're feeding on dead mammals. So uh, anyway, that's, that's a little bit about them. And of course, they're beautiful, right? I mean, they're just absolutely gorgeous, right? OK, maybe not. But get to know their personalities. I trust you. You're, you're, you're going to start to overlook those looks. It's, it's like the Beauty and the Beast. You know? You're like, at the beginning of the movie, you're thinking, boy, this guy's hideous. By the end, you're like, I love this guy. So it's kind of like Condors. Well, they, they like to nest in really out-of-the-way places. This is probably the most difficult nest we ever entered. For a period of time, we were climbing into Connor nests to do a lot of research. We were worried about DDT that I was telling you about earlier. Uh, thankfully, uh, even though it is still in the environment, it is, it is not causing eggshell thinning in condors to a point where we're worried about it. But we studied it, and we can check it off the box. This nest was 180 feet up in a redwood tree. Uh, condors like to nest in cavities, and they like to get as far away from people as possible. Um, they also nest in cliffs, and this cliff site, uh, you know, a little bit more inland compared to that Big Sur redwood nest, uh, is also a favorite. About 50% are in cliff nests, and 50% are in redwood trees. So I mentioned we studied DDT. We were really worried about it at first. Uh, the birds that feed primarily on California sea lions, ironically, um, because sea lions have the highest level of DDE, which is the metabolite, that's what actually causes thinning of eggshells. Uh, California sea lions have the highest levels of any marine mammal on the coastline, and that is the one species that condors feed on a lot. And uh, so, you know, we we're really worried about it first, and, and the females that are that are uh, really feeding on sea lions a lot have the thinnest eggshells, and they also have the highest amount of DDE in their eggs. So it's quite clear that uh, it, this is still an ongoing problem, uh, but thankfully when we compare it to the whole uh, population statewide, it, there's no difference. And in other words, the reproduction in Central California is just as good as it is in Southern California. So thankfully, it's not a big concern, but I just wanted to address it. That's also a bunch of uh, press coverage right now. 
some work that was done that's really not that eye-opening. Our work that's coming out soon is going to be much more uh, useful. <clears throat> so what is the biggest cause of our uh, difficulties? Lead poisoning, clearly. We have documented lead poisoning deaths. Uh, well, I think it's in an upcoming slide. Um, but it is by far the most common cause of death. No, nothing else even comes close. And, and you can understand why. Uh, lead ammunition is predominantly still the most commonly used ammunition. Uh, in the state of California, there's a requirement to use non-lead ammunition, but we're the only state that, that requires it for rifle ammunition. And the market is really not supporting it very well. So we have this ongoing problem of of the use of, of ammunition entering the condor's food supply. And how that happens is a bullet will hit an animal, say this photo here, and even if the, the entire bullet is not left behind, oftentimes it leaves behind a whole trail of, of bullet fragments. Lead bullets tend to fragment. That's what they do. Uh, copper bullets, uh, other uh, alternatives such as tin, they tend not to do that. They tend to hold together very well. They tend to retain their mass. And in fact, if you are a hunter and you understand ballistics, you know that you want your bullet to mushroom out very predictably. Lead bullets do that very well, but they also break up into a bunch of pieces. So they've come up with really good alternatives that do the same thing, where they open up and they have maximum killing power, uh, so it's humane, uh, but it does not have lead and it does not break up into little fragments and it does not get left behind for scavengers to feed upon. So that's the, that's the whole problem. And when we started 25 years ago, we had maybe a tiny little hint that this was an ongoing problem, but we had no idea how big of a problem it was. Uh, over 110 condor deaths since I've started this program from this one cause, representing 51%. So all of the dead birds that we've collected, 51% are attributed to this one cause. It's just amazing. But hunters and ranchers are the solution. And I, you know, I mentioned I grew up in West Virginia. I'd be remiss not to tell you that I grew up hunting. And I understand uh, and, and respect the traditions of hunting and ranching. And especially now, because they are the key to success. They're the ones that have the land. They're the ones that have the habitat that these condors are flying around over trying to survive in. And all we need to do, <laughs> it's not that easy, is switch to non-lead alternatives, non-lead ammunition. Uh, and I'm talking about rifle ammunition. Many of you may have recall in the 1990s in the waterfowl hunting uh, world, you know, it, Fish and Wildlife Service banned uh, lead ammunition for waterfowl, waterfowl hunting. So that's a shotgun. That's different than a rifle. Uh, so, you know, for several decades, shotgun, ha you know, users have, have used non-lead alternatives and they're quite used to it. Rifle users are not used to using anything other than lead. It's a, it's a fairly new thing. Um, and the market has been slow to kind of catch up and, and, and produce viable products. Thankfully, there are some really good products out there, um, but it, the market is just really slow to respond. For example, we went around to every little local store that sells ammunition, and only one of them had non-lead 22 that we were looking for. All the others did not have it. Now, 22 ammunition is the most common ammunition out there, most commonly used on the ranch. And seven out of eight did not even carry it. So, you know, you get my point here. Um, we really would like people to be able to switch because that's what needs to happen for, for scavengers to, to have a better chance of surviving out there, and the condor in particular. So we believe in this so much. Ten years ago, we became a licensed ammunition vendor. <laughs> When it first uh, came out, the Monterey County Weekly did an article on us, and they said, you know, most wildlife conservation organizations hand out plushy toys. <laughs> Not Ventana Wildlife Society. Well, actually, we do. Um, but no, we, we realized, you know, we needed to, uh, you know, we needed to put our, our money where our mouth was, so to speak. And, and, you know, it's not just lip service that we really do want to help people switch 
So we became a licensed ammunition vendor. We started distributing ammunition. We could, we could ship it directly to their home. Uh, we would figure out where the birds were moving and then that we would redirect the ammunition to wherever the, the condors are. We were just being as strategic as we, as we possibly could. Things were starting to go pretty well. Then the Safety for All Act was passed, which requires ammunition to be uh, purchased in person. And that just made everything so much harder. And then COVID hit, and you hear a lot about uh, supply chain problems. Well, ammunition, there's the same issue. And so for, for a long, long period of time, really important, commonly used calibers were just unavailable. Non-lead was just not available. So, you know, it's, it's sort of understandable then that, that this, this problem would continue to persist. Now, I'll just go quickly here because I don't know how much time I have, but normally lead poisoning is our biggest problem. In fact, if we look at where condors were, all populations combined, there were only about 300 and some alive last year and 13 of them died from lead poisoning. The year before that, 12. So it's, it's, you know, it sounds like small numbers, but the whole population is small. You know, so you gotta, you gotta keep that in mind. Um, but normally, it's just lead poisoning. And in 2020, we had uh, an arsonist who was just convicted recently, uh, start a wildfire, completely unrelated to our project. Um, and... Yeah. yeah. Could the owner of a blue Prius that's parked in a handicap space out here um, move that car? We can't get an RV that get, needs to go in and he can't negotiate by shoot. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> so, Dolan Fire. Um, this, this fire was started un unrelated to our project, um, but nevertheless was very close to where our reintroduction program was taking place. And condors don't fly at night. Um, this was a, a, a safe place for them. And unfortunately, the Dolan fire burned through about 2.30 or 3.30 in the middle of the night, where it was very dark. And uh, we had 10, uh, well, nine condors that died that night in the fire and a 10th was later found with severe bird injuries, and two chicks uh, also died in, in uh, the fire too. So, you know, we had this, this massive uh, one-time die-off of 12 birds just practically overnight, and, and that was, you know, incredibly devastating. So I just wanted to share a little bit about that. Um, the video on the left is a chick that was being raised on camera for all the world to see. And the video on the right is that same chick many months later with the Dolan fire raging outside. Cam viewers were watching in horror and then the, the cable cut out. The fire melted the cable and the view went dead. And for weeks, emails and phones ringing off the hook. How's oh, Aniko doing? Aniko's the chick. Aniko was named by the public. Aniko means born during troubled times, which was apropos during COVID. Then this poor chick and her parents suffer this stolen fire. Well, uh, it turns out Aniko's father, 24 year old male, the oldest male in the flock was one of the nine birds that died. So his or her mother is named Redwood Queen uh, because she's been nesting in this redwood for the longest uh, for any of the birds in our flock, did a really amazing job of, of raising a Nico. Um, but to, long story short, she, she was really struggling to keep this chick uh, out there in the wild. This, this other neighboring male came in to try to, you know, uh, assert his dominance into the territory, and there was a little bit of a scuffle. And then Anikos now walking around with the limp, and all this stuff is being watched on on camera, by the way, in our streaming cameras. And so my field crew go and, and rescue this chick and take it to the Los Angeles Zoo. And for a year, this bird stayed in the zoo. And the last December, we released this, this bird to the wild. And just last week, we showed a video of Aniko and Redwood Queen reuniting at a carcass site. 
And it was, yes, thank you for the awes. Thank you. See, now they're not so ugly are they, anymore, are they? <laughs> but this is, this is why we love telling these bird stories, even when it's a catastrophe like this, because they're just such interesting animals and you really get to know them as, as individuals. So after the fire burned through, we went up and saw the complete devastation. We lost everything. Uh, and we pay tribute to King Pen. We're in the process of rebuilding. We've cleared out a bunch of hazard trees. We fixed the road. Uh, we've uh, started the reconstruction of the Connor Release Facility. Uh, this is this is the San Simeon release site where we released the Nico. So we have a release site in San Simeon as well as Big Sur and then at Pinnacles, our partner. So in Central California, we have three different places where we can release condors to the wild. But Big Sur temporarily has been down because of the Dolan fire. And just looking at the population in California only, so this is not all populations, but just California only, you can see how we were cruising along, things were going great, and then these last two years have been really uh, discouraging. We've gone backwards in, in population in the last two years in a row. That's the first time in my 25 years that that's happened. So I'm really, really worried. And, and it's, it's partly because of the Dolan fire, and that's, that's an anomaly. I don't think that's going to be an ongoing thing. But I'm worried because we haven't solved the lead poisoning problem, and it's an ongoing uh, big problem. Just to take a quick look at where you'll, where you'll see condors in California, down in Big Sur, you'll see them along the Highway 1. Go to Pinnacles, you go up to the High Peaks, you have a great opportunity to see them there. Go down to Southern California, a uh, little bit more tricky for advice, but uh, if, you, if you really are interested, let me know. I'll look it up for you. Um, sometimes they even fly up into the Southern Sierra, though it's not going to be that common because they're not actively being released there. So anyway, um, I don't know, maybe I'm just an eternal optimist, but after 25 years, I really do think that we can do this. Uh, we're on the right path. Um, you know, I'm two, two out of two, I'm two for two so far, so I really want to make it three for three. <laughs> Uh, but in all joking, you know, this is a species that, that really deserves to be here on this planet. It really did nothing wrong, and it's had everything but the kitchen sink thrown at it, and yet it, it's still here today. It is a true resilient survivor, and I think we ought to just do what we can for it. Anyway, thank you very much. If you have any questions. Okay, so the question is, are, are other, uh, other animals like uh, hawks and vultures, you asked the question, losing ground. From a population standpoint, no, but from an individual standpoint, absolutely. Um, the, the difference is red-celled hawks, turkey vultures, and, and most other species reproduce more quickly so that it doesn't affect the population at the same level. Plus, we're talking about a, 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 an obligate scavenger. So they only eat dead animals. Whereas red-tailed hawks, they take live prey way more often than they, than they scavenge. So there's a lot less opportunity to get lead, and they breed more quickly. Does that, that make sense? Yes, it does. Great. Thanks for asking that question. Uh, how much more percentage-wise does uh, um, non-lead ammunition cost over mm. Yeah, well, you know, obviously that's a great question because that's one of the key issues is, is, is cost. A lot of people in the beginning uh, of the program were, uh, or not program, but, um, you know, opponents of, of the switch really talked a lot about cost. But, you know, if you're, if you're a hunter, if you're a big game hunter and you, you buy one box of 20 rounds, you might use a few to sight the gun in 
you know, if you're a decent shot, you're going to few, you know, maybe shoot a few more. I mean, in other words, one box ought to last you a while. And the difference between one box is not a whole lot of money, you know, maybe 15, 20 bucks or something. Now, if you're talking about smaller caliber ammunition and you're shooting a thousand rounds a month, then it can start to add up. So, you know, but, but it is more costly. Yeah. Yeah. So the um, question is the Andean uh, condor in South America. A lot of people ask if they're the same species. By the way, they're they're definitely not. Um, they're somewhat related. They're both New World vultures, but they're not they're not the same species. Andean condors are a little bit bigger. Um, and in South America, it depends on where to get to your question. In some places, their their population is doing very well. Other places, they're declining. And it's the same reasons. It's lead poisoning. It's uh, and, and in that case, there's also direct shooting. Still, there's still a lot of folks that are that are shooting them. Whereas in in North America, our condors aren't really being shot at anymore. So there's some differences, but but very similar kind of plight. The good news is in South America, though, there's a lot more of them, and there's there's a lot more opportunity to to protect them before they get to nearly extinct. I could repeat it. Well, so the question is, can we ban the, the, uh, the, the use of ammunition? And, and in fact, that's what the ban is. It's, but maybe you're, you're going at banning the sale. A lot of people think that the ban is the ban on the sale, but it's, it's not. It's, it's a ban on the use. So you can still buy lead ammunition. That's the Second Amendment right to protect ourselves and so on. So you're still able to buy it. And I remember that was the big argument. You know, it's like, no, you can't, you can't ban the sale. Just, just the use. Uh, so that's that's the, the current state of the statute. Is a ban on the use. Thank you. Well, Kelly, we really thank you very much for uh, sharing with us. And uh, there's more information available. So you want to mention about the brochure? Yeah, uh, I've always find there's a few people who are really interested. So if you're one of those folks, please come up and take one of my annual reports from last year. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me.